Please welcome Vice Chairman and CEO of Expedia Group, Peter Kern, in conversation with Skift founding editor and executive editor, Dennis Shaw. Hey, Peter. Welcome to your first Skift Global Forum as CEO. You became CEO in April, not the greatest timing in the world, Peter, but uh, some people might not know that you've been a member of the Expedia board since 2005. You've been vice chairman since 2018. So take us behind the scenes. What have these these last, you know, very harried uh, few months been like and, and what have your priorities been? Yeah, well, thanks, Dennis, for having me and inviting me. Um, I would say, uh, as I've said to many people, it's pretty much what you expect, which is to say there aren't a lot of surprises in the sense of the overall marketplace. You've had many CEOs on today, uh, you know, talking about how tough it's been. And I think it's been tough for all of us. Uh, It's obviously tough on our employee base. Uh, We've had to make some hard decisions, just like a lot of other companies. it's been, you know, it was for a long time was very tough on consumers as they had to win their way through unraveling their travel plans. And, uh, and then we've been working hard to make sure they can make travel plans safely and thoughtfully. Uh, so there's a lot of work going into that. But I would say, you know, mostly for our company, it's been a time of internal reflection and a lot of work to focus on how do we make the, the service stronger, the consumer uh, service better? How do we, uh, help power the industry and help our our travel partners come back as quickly as they can uh and just how do we overall end up in a stronger position coming out of this we know we're going to suffer like everybody else uh during the trough but uh you know what can we do to be uh, stronger on the other end so that's been most of my time i would say uh spent on that since i started sure so actually this process started uh in late last year, a whole restructuring process. Uh, Barry, uh, he had a, an employee meeting and he, he announced that uh, the company was bloated and he had some harsh things to say. Uh, do you have an update on the restructuring, how much costs you've cut? And more, more importantly for us, what's changed about your operations? I know you've eliminated some brands like a couple of short-term rental brands. Uh, brands, Apartment Jet and Pillow. Um, what else have you done? Have you consolidated other brands or other operation? What, what's been stream, streamlined? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, when, when Barry and I came in at that time and Barry made those comments, our, our focus was really on simplifying the company. Uh, I think uh, his, his comments, uh, and he is, he is always good for a colorful comment, but I think it was a reflection of the fact that we'd become so complex as a company that we kind of couldn't help ourselves from being bigger than we needed to be and more complicated than we needed to be. And so the exercise we've been going through, which includes what you just referenced in terms of some of our smaller brands, uh, there are other business activities Uh, many of which nobody would have ever seen on the outside that uh, we were chasing that didn't make sense that we've we've cut. Um, But more importantly, we've we've gone about integrating the underlying uh, technology platforms that we operate on. We had a very siloed company. Each of our brands had lots of their own technology. Uh, We didn't have as many shared resources as we probably should. We redo, you know, we would build and then rebuild and rebuild an, uh, the same activity across seven brands or seven locations. We had many data lakes and different things. So we just haven't had everything in a, in a simplified way where we could really go faster, be more agile, do more for the consumer and our partners. And we're really on that journey right now. We are deep in it and uh, it will take us some time. But we have gone from you know, I, I've said to the company, I think we have more data, a more complete data set on the world's travel than anybody in the world. But we never had it in one place. It was in multiple places broken up. Mm. You couldn't source it all. You couldn't teach your machines. You couldn't use AI against the whole data set, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, bringing that all together, uh, I think, has enormous power to unlock capabilities for us in the industry. Um, but we're really doing it kind of for the first time across many of our of our much of our technology stack. And so it's a real change for us. It's a cultural change. It's got its bumps for sure. But um, but we're really excited about where it's where it's going to take us. 
Yeah, you, you hear often about companies talking about, well, we have the largest data set in the world, you know, and, and we could do so much with this, but uh, being able to use it and deploy it, that's a whole other story, right? Exactly. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's until you use it to the customer or the partner's good, it doesn't really do a whole lot. It's just a bunch of storage. So right. <laughs> we've got to learn how to create value with it, value for our consumers and, and value for our partners. And we think we absolutely can do that. So let's talk about Verbo. So um, the former VRBO and uh, VRBO had its problems, you know, uh, in the last couple of years. One of them was the transition to Verbo. Uh, you know, the, the brand lost a lot of SEO value in the process, but Verbo has been pretty much the star of, uh, has been a big story and, and, and the star of the the group uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I know you noted that in June, Expedia's uh, overall bookings had dropped to, I believe, uh, uh, down only 45% uh, year over year versus down 85% in April. And a lot of the, the moderation in that trend was uh, because of Verbo. So um, what are you seeing now in terms of Verbo? Has it been able to sustain that that growth and and our vacation rentals still trending over hotels. How, how's it going there? Yeah, um, vacation rentals have absolutely been trending uh, much more strongly than hotels. Uh, I'm sad for our hotel partners in that regard, but uh, we've been fortunate to have Verbo and have an offset um, that that's helped us along. I think uh, the demand for vacation rentals has been super strong. We've seen people. Uh, looking for the avenues they can to travel. We know people want to travel if they can. And so far that has meant a lot of uh, domestic travel, a lot of drive to travel. And the whole home solution that Verbo presents is a very attractive option as people have wanted to sort of hole up with their families, be safe with a small group that in their little bubble that they, that they know is safe for them. So we've had a, um, a terrific opportunity to to capitalize on that. I think in many ways, it's brought us a lot of new customers and a lot of new discovery, which is really, to your point, uh, we, we did have a little bit of a bumpy ride crossing over to the Verbo brand and landing that brand. And, um, and the business had, had you know, was, was not as robust as, as we had hoped in 2019, because, in part because of that. But I think this year is very strong. This year is a new opportunity to land that brand with so many new customers who are having great experiences out there staying at our properties um, and seeing the value of, of that kind of travel. And so I think, you know, again, it's always been one of the many pieces of travel that we want to be as Expedia, um, but it is a much more powerful piece this year. And we think that strength will carry over into the future and it will help with the long-term value of the brand, you know, globally. So, so we feel very good about that. Great. So one thing uh, people might not know is that you have Verbo, which is your vacation rental brand, but Expedia separately, Expedia.com does a little bit of uh, its own vacation, its own short-term rental business. Why, why go that route? Is it different inventory? What, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, I'd say the initial reasoning was in large part a function of where, where we were a few minutes ago on our complexity. And uh, it was challenging ah. to bring Verbo content uh, and supply across to the rest of our OTA brands. Uh, and so one of the solutions uh, we went after was just sourcing independent, uh, easily bookable online content that we could bring over. There were some differences in the nature of that, con of that supply. And uh, and there was a little different focus in how we went after it, but in large part, it was a, a structural issue for us. Uh, but where we're headed is, you know, is a convergence where all of that supply uh, will be available on any of our brands anywhere. So uh, that is a technological process we are going through to drive that. Um, but that is really uh, what drove that differentiation. I will say that we're also we've also brought together all our supply organizations so another one of our moves towards simplifying our company so that in one place all the people that have been sourcing alternative accommodations whether they be at verbo or or in the the traditional enterprise 
they're doing it together as one group and and that group is aligned with the group that's doing hotel supply and and all other forms of supply so uh that is a place we hope to get stronger we haven't been great on it in terms of uh, how we uh, make that supply evident to consumers uh, in our main OTA brands, but uh, but it's something we will get better at, and uh, and I think we'll drive incremental demand that way. So when it comes to uh, vacation rental and short-term rental hosts, there's been a lot of chatter uh, among Airbnb hosts that are really pissed off at the company because uh, – they initially unilaterally refunded uh, guests and, and, and left hosts high and dry. There's been talk about, uh, you know, we're going to be doing direct booking now and leave, leave Airbnb. Have you, have you felt any of that? Uh, have, have you been able to uh, take any advantage of that, any of that? Yeah, I think we've, we've heard it and we've seen some of it. Um, and clearly there have been some, people who have come across to our platform uh, because of those kinds of things. We haven't really been trying, you know, our goal is not to, we're all in a tough spot, everyone in travel. Our goal is not to try to hit another, you know, another player while they're down. Um, we're certainly down. We hope they don't do it to us. Um, but I think we've seen uh, some advantage from that. I think we tried to take a very balanced view. My approach was, there are human beings on both sides of this equation, whether you're a homeowner or a traveler. Uh, it sucks for everybody, and uh, we have to come up with a fair solution, and we tried to come up with the fairest solution that we could. So I think we were a more balanced approach. I, I understood the, uh, the desire to just make the consumer happy. That's always a nice thing to be able to do. And uh, we wish we could have done it in good conscience, but we sort of felt like we had to balance the uh, the priorities amongst everybody. So, um, so I would say, uh, you know, we've seen some benefit from it. We've certainly, you know, again, Verbo has been very robust for us. Uh, my understanding is Airbnb has been enjoying good times as well. So I don't think either of us is really getting one over on the other, but I will say for a while now, uh, you know, the Verbo app has been top of the list. We've been very present and, and, and much more competitive and share a voice in terms of what we're seeing in the marketplace. So we're pleased with that. And, uh, you know, we hope that continues for our sake. The last time I interviewed you a few months ago, you were even uh, sort of putting out a feeler of being open to partnering with Airbnb at some point. Did, it, did anything ever happen with that? Uh, not, not so far, um, you know, and, and, I wouldn't say we've been actively after it. We've all got plenty of our own problems to deal with. But I do think uh, we certainly envision a world where uh, we are we we mean to be best in class in uh, a lot of the things we do, whether it's selling hotel rooms or renting cars or activities or other things. And uh, there are certainly lots of opportunities. Our, our Expedia Partner Services business has been growing extremely well, uh, where we're powering third parties, powering offline travel agents, regional OTAs, you know, Amex Chase rewards programs, et cetera. And uh, we're definitely, you know, open to and hoping to power more of the industry. So if there are opportunities that make sense for us in Airbnb, we'd certainly consider it. Uh, Expedia Partner Services, you don't, uh, you don't give a lot of uh, transparency to um, the size of the business and how it's doing. It's, it's never really broken out, but it's a really big part of your business, isn't it? It's become an increasingly big part of our business, and, and I hope it continues to. I think it goes to our core capabilities of, of trying to power the industry and improve everybody's businesses. So, you know, from our perspective, if we can improve, you know, an airline partner's ability to sell hotel rooms and monetize that opportunity, if we can help hotel operators monetize other opportunities for them. We're, we're looking at all of those possibilities. Uh, we've had to come a long way technologically, and I'm sure we will go a long way in the next 12 to 18 months as we simplify our overall technology structure. But um, our goal is to be a partner to the industry and to drive as much as we can. And we think being best in class across a number of capabilities that we can really help drive some business for our partners. And we want to help do that. This time next month, it's possible that, that Airbnb, Airbnb could be a public company. Uh, I interviewed Glenn Fogel this morning and he was saying, it really doesn't make much difference uh, in terms of 
the competitive set or operations, you know, other than he, he can't wait to look at their numbers. Do you feel the same way? Do you think uh, Airbnb going public is a difference maker of any sort? I don't think so. I mean, I, I uh, you know, I'm curious to see what they're valued at. Um, I'm curious to see how people think about that business. But they're also going to be encumbered by all the same things that Glenn and I have to deal with every month and every quarter. And, um, you know, whether the market, how the market tolerates different approaches to earnings and revenue growth and other things, you know, varies by company. But that's certainly an added set of pressures for them that they've been able to ignore for a long time. So I think... uh, I don't think it changes the game for anybody. I think it just shows the scope of their business. They've built a tremendous business, of course, uh, that we all admire, but, uh, but we all compete uh, in their space and, you know, and they may well decide to compete in our space. And uh, I don't think it really changes much. I think, you know, I wish them well. I'm sure they'll be highly valued. Speaking of some of the things that uh, Expedia uh, booking holdings and Airbnb have to deal with, uh, there's really been, you know, what seems to be increased regulation of the short-term rental market. There was a a court ruling in Europe yesterday that uh, limited uh, rentals of of second homes. Expedia came up with uh, a a very interesting partnership in San Diego where the short-term rental industry, industry was facing an outright ban and you negotiated a deal with the hotel union, uh, to permit short-term rentals, but at you know a very lower number than than exists today, Chicago just banned uh, one-night stays for short-term rentals. So, with this increased regulation, do you think there's really a, a, a runway for vast growth of, of this sector, or the, are its best days behind it? You know, I think I think uh, look, I think there's a lot of growth still to come. I think there's lots and lots of consumers out there in the world who have never experienced. Uh, the alternative accommodation approach to life and how it can improve, in some cases, their travel experiences. So, so I think there's plenty of demand that that can and should be there. I think um, I think regulation is a challenge, and of course, lo- local governments and municipalities are trying to do what's right for their people. I think our approach has always been to try to work with them as as well as we can to drive understanding, to drive safe. Uh, rulemaking and things that help drive the local economy and help local homeowners and etc. I think uh, they're all trying to do their best and, and we're trying to work collaboratively with them as we as we did in San Diego. Um, but uh, we think there's there's plenty of growth because frankly we think that uh, there's lots of people like like now during COVID who are experiencing this for the first time and if they can do that and have a good experience uh, we think that's going to be great and um, and so we think it's sustainable growth for a long time. So both of us are native New Yorkers, and we were um, trading uh, Studio 54 and Palladium stories in the green room before. But uh, have you been to New York lately and seen, you know, so many people have left, so many businesses um, have shut down. Uh, do you think big cities like New York are dead? And what would that mean for, t- uh, for tourism? Yeah, I was in New York uh, about a month ago, um, and uh, it was great to be back and great to see more more restaurants open for outside dining and and people on the streets and everybody being responsible and wearing their masks. Um, it is quiet. I described it that you know every day felt like Sunday morning in summer, uh, and I think that's that's still kind of the case. Uh, I think the idea that big cities are going away is close to laughable. Uh, you know, as I've said to people, you know, Rome has been around a long time and I'm pretty sure it's been through a pandemic or two or, uh, you know, some, some disaster or another that ran everybody out of town briefly. Uh, I think, you know, New York came back from 9-11. I, somebody asked me about it previously and I said, you know, after 9-11, everybody was leave, moving out of New York. People with young kids were afraid. I, I got it. I understood it. But pretty soon people were coming back. And then two years later, you know, I think we went on an 18 year bull market run in real estate values. So, you know, Paris isn't going away. London is not going away. Rome's not going away. New York's not going away. I think um, I understand the sentiment. I'm not sure what everybody's trying to avoid if they're all going to hide out in a suburban cul-de-sac and avoid human contact. But 
uh, that gets pretty boring pretty fast in my experience. And uh, I think young people and people with ambition and people who want the energy of cities will go back and cities will be robust again in no time and, and we will forget this. Now, when is this going to be over? When does the return start? That I don't know, but I'm not worried about New York. Great. So uh, you've been very outspoken about, uh, about Google, about wanting to reduce Expedia's reliance on Google. Airbnb is supposedly trying to, um, you know, downplay its Google marketing and, and is trying to see if that could be a c competitive advantage. What have you learned so far about actually doing that? And, and what's the silver bullet? How do you do it? Tell the industry. Everybody wants to know. <laughs> I don't have the silver bullet and we are certainly not the best at it. Um, you know, there are a lot of all our competitors spend all their time trying to figure it out too. I would say my perspective kind of where I, we started this conversation is, you know, it's an internal reference point, which is uh, Google's going to be Google. Google's a shark, you know, sharks have to hunt, right? That's what they do. Uh, we're not going to stop them. Maybe the governments will get involved and curtail some of their activities, but you know, we by ourselves can't do it. So we have to be really good at all the things that we can control. And that means making the consumer experience really robust and valuable and make them want to return directly. That means making everything sticky and, um, and helping people, you know, giving them a reason to come back, a reason to be an Expedia, uh, you know, loyalty member or hotels loyalty member, et cetera. You know, all of those pieces go into how sticky. I mean, we think of all our consumer experiences, right? Like, when do you just go into the Google bar and type Paris Hotel? Or when do you go in and say, I don't need the Google bar. I've got the Expedia app on my phone. And when we're doing better at that, we will decrease our reliance on Google. From my perspective, Google is a place you take your big fishing net out and you go skim the seas for customers and you don't particularly make much money on those customers. But once you have them, if you can keep them and if you can serve them well, they will come back and they will have a reason to find you directly. And that will be a much more robust you know, relationship between the company and the consumer. So that's what we have to do. It's not a silver bullet. We're all trying to do it, but we haven't done a particularly great job of it. Frankly, we paid lip service to it, but I don't think we put as much effort into it as we could in terms of resources and care. And uh, we've got to put the consumer first and we've got to make that experience great and valuable. And then things should take care of themselves. I hear you. So let's talk a little bit about hotels and hotel relationships. I noticed on the Expedia homepage where it used to be have a hotel tab and a vacation rental tab. Now it just says stays. What went into that decision and what kind of feedback have you gotten so far on that? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't count that as a de-emphasis of hotels so much as a simplification for the consumer experience to understand what they're, what they're getting into and what they're going to see. Uh, look, we, we want nothing more than for our hotel partners to return to their vibrancy that they had before all this hit. Uh, we've done a lot, excuse me, as a company to try to uh, help them re reinvigorate their business, give them ways that they can work with us to, um, to revive what's going on uh, around the world. Uh, so that is critical to us. We are not de-emphasizing them in any way, but as you referenced earlier, uh, we had this alternative accommodation business. It wasn't particularly discoverable in a simple way for consumers across all our sites. So we are going through our own process of finding the best way for consumers to discover what they want and make the right choices for them. And, and look, there are use cases where hotels will make the most sense and use cases where alternative will make the most sense. We want the consumer to have an easy process for figuring that out. And, uh, and we think everybody will get their rightful share of the market and that will not hurt hotels. I have three quick hotel questions. One from the audience, what's been the response to your hotel industry recovery assistance program where you're handing out marketing credits? Any insights or take-ups uh, on the uplift or uh, from participating hotels? Yeah, the take-up has been quite strong. I would say better than we even hoped. Um, and so far from what we can tell, those, place, those hotels that have availed themselves of it have been using the marketing and have been using it to great effect and getting, you know, getting real performance out of that. So for us, it was partly to help everybody out. It was partly to give them an experience with the product so they could understand how to drive their own businesses. And, um, 
and so far it's been a resounding success, I would say. So we had Barry Diller here yesterday who has a certain interest in IAC and Expedia. And he was talking about, uh, you know, taking a billion dollar stake in MGM. He's now on the MGM board. Uh, the two IAC and Expedia run independently, but are there any advantages for Expedia from Barry's investment in MGM? Well, ironically, there are probably a number of other places he could have invested that would have helped us more. We have a very, very strong working relationship with MGM already. Uh, we are a huge driver of business to Vegas. And of course, MGM is the biggest player in Vegas. Um, so uh, I would say we had a very good relationship already. Uh, if there are opportunities to learn and do better and do more from that, relationship that would be great and we would certainly hope to take it across all of our partners so um you know nothing obvious to me but uh but i hope it's a good investment for ic we certainly wish them well and very well on that investment and uh he seems quite excited about it and um you know we're we're excited to continue our strong relationship with mgm but i think if there's learnings from it uh you know we'll, we'll see what those are and we'll certainly hope to bring them across all of our partners. You have another strong hotel, hotel relationship with Marriott. Uh, you recently became the exclusive distributor of Marriott wholesale rates. Um, what does this do for Expedia? Um, and what does this do for MetaSearch where, which was you know, plagued with problems of rogue wholesale rates being you know, offered directly to consumers? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I'm not sure what it does to MetaSearch other than maybe make it a fair fight for everybody. But our goal in it was um, was really to help Marriott and, and frankly, other partners to clean up the wholesale side of the business. We think that given our technology base, given our scope and our reach, we can uh, help them police and distribute their wholesale uh, rates in the right places where they're intended, not get them you know, run around in places they were not intended and, and, and screw up the market. You know, I'm often saying to our own people that, um, you know, we want our, you know, our, our ultimate goal has to be for our suppliers to optimize their business and make the most money they can. And that's not by uh, accidentally leaking out a wholesale rate that was meant for some small cohort of people in China that ends up, you know, on a MetaSearch site uh being bought by somebody in des moines so um you know we're there to help uh we think it it strengthens our relationship with marriott which is obviously important to us but we're basically hoping to roll that out to any hotelier who wants to and and we are rolling it out to many others uh as an opportunity to help you know help price uh certainty and help them know that uh they're not going to be underselling themselves accidentally and having these rogue problems. So we think we can help them help ourselves, help the market be fair and not be competing against these rates that they never intended to be out there and we never intended to compete against. So it's all, I think it's all to the good for, for all the players in the industry. In, in a simple 30 seconds, where do you see the next wave of disruption coming in travel? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I, I see Air I, Asia trying to become an OTA. Have you have you have you been following that? Look, I think I think increasingly uh, all the players in the market will be looking to sell more things. Right? We we power a number of airlines that want to sit, be better at selling hotel rooms or activities or car rental. Uh, we're, I think we're going to see everybody. You know, the travel business isn't simple. It's uh, there's a long tail of people who participate in it. And I think, you know, I hope we're part of a wave of disruption in the sense of helping to power all those players to do what they do better and make more money. And we'll make ours along the way in helping them. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity along that path. I think, you know, we continue to see new innovation in small startups, whether it's in a new service or a new way of thinking about price discovery or fintech kinds of ideas. Uh, I think those are all interesting. So far, I haven't bumped into anything that I think is usually scalable or anything, but but I think we'll see more of those. And that's, you know, that's why entrepreneurs exist. But I think uh, right now uh, we all have a path just to get back to our regular footing and be better at what we're doing. And then I think, you know, I think I think consumer centricity will get stronger. I think um, 
there's more we can do for consumers. There's more we can do to help them make good decisions and create value for them. I don't think we've done great at that. We've been commerce engines largely. We've been places that people have to go to different places and compare everything. I think we can do better about that and build stronger relationships. So I hope I hope we can help be part of a, a movement there. Peter, I'm going to get disrupted right off the stage if I go any longer. So thank you so much. It was really good. Thank it's you. Good to talk to you, Dennis. Thank you. Take you too. Care.